All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. This is Patricia Miller with Cannabis Tech Talks. I'm here today with the CEO of TerraVera, Mr. Carlos Perea. Um, TerraVera is a tech company working to reduce or even replace pesticides in commercial cannabis production. Um, Carlos, I'm thrilled you could join us today. Patricia, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, so I'd love to start out with a little bit of your background. What sort of got you involved in the cannabis space or interested in it? Um, well, I was fortunate. I had uh, run a company, I guess, in the sustainability area. I, I ran a company that dealt with water technology, making water safe to drink. Uh, and I ran that for a number of years from 2006 to 2016. And then a former employee of mine got in the legal cannabis industry in that time frame in the Oregon market and started asking for help. And, and I became fascinated with the industry for probably two fundamental reasons. One is uh, I'm a big believer in natural medicine, just like I am in, in natural food and a trend in that direction. I became enamored with the medical benefits of cannabis. Uh, and then the second piece was just the business. The business opportunity struck me as, as phenomenal. I, I think that uh, it pr presents one of the better areas for folks to have some social justice where minorities and, and female-led businesses can actually be as successful because there's no track record or history, so to speak. So those were the two things that really attracted me. But I've been in the industry since 2016, I guess. Okay. Yeah, those are great reasons to join. And then you're co-founder of TerraVera as well. So what kind of um, drew you to this concept? Well, when I got in the industry, I started out um, helping a vertically integrated group in Oregon. And then I got the opportunity to become the chief operations officer for one of the first uh, publicly traded companies or multi-state operators. And they were moving from investment to owning and operating. And so I got to see some of the issues that face cultivators. I got a, a chance to talk with dozens, if not hundreds of cultivations. And, you know, I really learned the problems that they face and the issues they, they deal with where if they don't treat their product, they end up potentially with molds, mildew that can devalue the crops or in worst cases, pathogens that can make people sick. Um, and then on the other side, they just don't have a lot of tools available to them to, to make that product safe. So this was an area that I just identified as one of the biggest issues that's preventing cannabis from becoming higher quality at less cost. And, and that's where I want to see the industry go. Absolutely. And it is a medicine. And I think how it's tended and the possible pathogens that can be present in it is is super important, can't be overstated, particularly for medical patients. Um, so I'd love to dive into the technology a little bit. Can you explain sort of what it does and how does this work? Yeah, let me uh, just take one brief moment uh, yeah. to say that in a weird way, TerraVera came about because of two places in my life. One is getting cannabis and seeing the issue. And the other was that company I had mentioned in the water treatment space. That, that company actually had its origins within the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, where the government was looking for better ways to treat water than chlorine. And indeed, TerraVera's technology is based on that same core technology that, that was used and is used today to treat water for viruses and bacteria. Um, and it's used by the by the military. It's used by public drinking water facilities all over the U.S. It's actually in 27 different countries. Uh, people like Coca-Cola and Intel use it for a variety of reasons. So the technology itself was very well developed, um, and I just went after it for a different application. Um, so that's kind of the marriage of these two worlds of my previous uh, role in environmental space and in cannabis kind of colliding. But to answer your question, the, the technology is really biomimicry. And what I tell folks is if you look at solutions, the most elegant are often what nature produces. And so what we're doing is we're not creating a new chemistry. We're taking a chemistry that our bodies produce naturally as part of our immune system. And we're doing biomimicry or a fancy way of saying we just use technology to do what our bodies do naturally. Mm. And what that chemistry does is it's a broad-based antimicrobial. It, it's very effective against viruses, bacteria, molds, mildews, and we use it for plants. And it turns out that plants are also sensitive creatures, just like humans are, uh, and the chemistry is pretty benign to plants, just like it is to humans. And so it's a, it's you, you call it a chemistry, and is that a chemical reaction that's occurring, or can you break it down a little more? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. To give you more specifics. What our bodies do is we take salts and amino acids that our bodies have naturally in us. And so if you have a cut or you're exposed to a virus or bacteria, your body is, is smart enough, intelligent enough 
to produce this chemistry and to try and fend off these pathogens that we don't want to get us sick. Um, we do that with a reactor. It's called electrolysis. But the simple way of doing this is we're forcing a chemical reaction of salts and amino acids. And all of this stuff is food grade quality, so very benign. Um, but in this process, we change this chemistry through um, adding energy in in the process. And we get a chemistry that is very effective against these, these microbes, but has also got uh, a very short shelf life and is, is pretty benign. Like I said, benign to human flesh. It's benign to plant tissue. It's benign to uh, surfaces, so it won't cause corrosion. Uh, you know, it's safe to be around. We've actually had folks who, I mean, we don't recommend this, but you can ingest it. It's not going to cause you any harm. You can get it in your eyes. It's not going to cause you any harm. And it's because your body's producing it naturally. Um, the chemistry though does break down pretty quickly. So you can't just bottle it up and ship it all over the place. It doesn't work that way. You kind of have to create it on site on demand as you need it and then use mm -hmm. it within a, a week or so of production in order to be effective. And then after that, it breaks back down into a salt and amino acid. Okay. And then it's applied topically to the plant. Yeah. Generally we started out really with foliar spray. Uh, most of our clients today have enough volume. They, they do it with fogging or misting. Um, some folks have automated systems that, that just do this as part of the automated treatment of the plants. Um, but generally speaking, for a new uh, customer who wants to try it out, we, we recommend fogging. It, it just, it's a wetted chemistry, so if it doesn't come in contact with the, the pathogen, it can't do its job. Okay. And again, once it, dry, once it dries, it also becomes inert. So I said you know, it breaks down after a week or so. If you just sprayed it on a surface and it was to dry, it also breaks back down into a, a naturally occurring salt and, and amino acid that's food-grade quality. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, and what's unique about this approach? Is this something other, other companies in the industry are doing or is Terra Vera kind of the first? Um, we are the first and to, to my knowledge, we're the only ones who are kind of approaching it this way. So generally speaking, the, and for good reason, most pesticides are not allowed on cannabis plants. And there's a host of reasons. Some are regulatory, some are safety. Um, but the same things we might use on food, we typically don't use on, on cannabis. Even the stuff we use on tobacco typically is not regulated and allowed in cannabis. And that's good because a lot of these pesticides really do cause a lot of harmful effects, especially if they're combusted. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you or your, your um, listeners might be familiar, but, you know, microbutanol or Eagle 20 was pretty commonly used in Colorado. It wasn't banned. And then we found out that not only was it something that was carcinogenic and problematic, but when you combust it, create cyanide um, gas and, you know, it can be very harmful. So mm -hmm. we have a host of reasons why we don't do those things. So people are kind of relegated to natural ingredients and natural solutions or remediating after the fact. So increasingly in popularity, you'll see states uh, and places where people are getting cannabis that's been irradiated. Um, as, as a means of controlling the pathogens at the end of the process. We're really, we can do that. We can, we can reverse that contamination. We can remediate, but we're really, really focused on the prevention side. So if we spray the plants when you have signs, or even if you don't have signs, you just want to be preventative, uh, that's typically where we come in as kind of a, a prevention technology. And to our knowledge, there really isn't anybody else kind of focused in this area. Most people, again, are are focused on the back end irradiating or, or reducing the pop problem after it's occurred. Yeah. And I have been hearing more about, you know, expansions in that technology, um, post-processing remediation versus during the growth um, itself. So this is exciting to hear about. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I think for the users, you're right. They're not just trying to get safe product. They're trying to get product that's effective and that smells and tastes good. And, and we believe that a, a healthy plant just does better job of expressing terpenes and cannabinoids and just going to be a, a, a more pleasant user experience than a plant that has been sick. And then you treat it afterwards to make sure it doesn't have a virus or bacteria. Um, so that's kind of our approach is, uh, is an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure kind of mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And so this doesn't have an effect on those qualities like terpenes or the smell or, or flavor of the plant. No, as a matter of fact, if anything, um, we think the plants that are treated with Terravera actually end up with with better um, expressions. You know, we don't have enough data to make claims on this yet, but the customers who've implemented have been focused on just making sure they don't lose crop value. I guess we should have started here and said, you know, for a grower 
of cannabis when they get a pathogen that they can't control. Let's say powdery mildew is a really common one. Mm. Um, the crop value goes way down. In some states, you have to destroy. In, some, in most places, you can remediate by turning it into oil instead of flour. Well, mm -hmm. that is just not as valuable. You lose about 80% of the crop value. Um, so that's a pretty big economic impact. So most of our clients are really focused on maximizing yields. But in that process, we found folks who've come back and said, hey, we're just seeing better plant growth, better uh, testing results, better cannabinoid profiles. Now we're starting to research that and understand it. That's not really why we created Carvera, but um, if it's an added benefit, we certainly want to let our customers know about that. And is this something that could have broader implications for the rest of the agricultural industry? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because we are focused on cannabis for a couple of reasons. Um, part of it is the background of myself and, and one of the other co-founders. And we see the, such a, an acute need here, especially with people using it for medical purposes. But um, we didn't found the company for cannabis. We really founded it to replace the pesticides that we think are polluting the planet and uh, ruining our food supply. So our broader mm -hmm. goal is to take this, prove it in cannabis, but to take it to indoor tomatoes, to take it to um, berries, to other produce that we really know is problematic with these pathogens and the current pesticides that are being used just have a lot of downside. And uh, even if you wash it off, even if you're not getting into your body, um, which often is impossible, you know, some of the stuff you spray mm -hmm. on food, you just never get it completely out. Um, even if that wasn't the case, the, the impact of the environment is huge. We're seeing uh, ecosystems destroyed. We're seeing reproductive problems in our, in our wildlife. Um, we're seeing soil and water being polluted, uh, in some cases, uh, pretty, uh, pretty severely. And this is something that uh, you can scale, right? I mean, this is something, it would be feasible for large scale agriculture, like you, for use outside or only indoor. Yeah, we are um, interested. We know it works well outdoor. That's not an issue. Um, there are some considerations, you know, we'd probably spray at night as opposed to the day to maximize the efficacy and some other things. Um, but yeah, pathogen is a pathogen. It doesn't matter if it's indoor or outdoor. But our focus today is really on indoor. And the reasons for that are not just the economics of it, but, you know, we kind of, especially if you take cannabis, we kind of created a new problem by trading off outdoor for indoor. We can control the environment. That's another common way people deal with these pathogens. They're really disciplined around the humidity and the temperatures, et cetera, which minimizes those prospects. Um, the problem is, is that these spores are really, um, they're everywhere. They're pervasive. And so you, you get them on your skin, you, you know, you go to a friend's farm and you come into the cannabis grow and guess what? You're carrying these pathogens with you. Um, but back to the outdoor thing. No, we really do eventually want to get into outdoor crops, but today our focus is predominantly indoor. We can scale up very effectively. We probably can't scale down too much more than we are today and, and be cost effective. So you know, we have customers who are as little as three or 400 plants, maybe 500 plants, and they're finding it to be very cost effective to use our treatment. But uh, uh, we don't see a day in the future where we're going to be appropriate for a home grow, as an example, or a, a small personal grow. Uh, but we definitely are, are dealing with and can deal with even larger customers than the 100,000 or 200,000 square feet that we have today. That's exciting. And so since it, as you mentioned, breaks down quickly, if this were to be used in an outdoor application and, you know, you mentioned some of the problems we've got with big agriculture right now, like that runoff of nutrients, um, it doesn't sound like this is something that would have negative effects like running, you know, if it were to run off, be absorbed into the soil, it sounds like it becomes inert after a short am amount of time. Correct. And that same thing with indoor or outdoor. It, it, it doesn't matter. It breaks back down into a salt, uh, a potassium salt and an amino acid that's naturally occurring. And so, you know, not only is it not going to cause harm in the environment or an indoor situation, um, you, quite frankly, you, you, unless you were testing for it, you wouldn't even see very different levels of the stuff because it's in the such small parts per million or billion. Um, you wouldn't even know you had sprayed it. And so, in, a, in an interesting way, we kind of have a, a zero impact once we've done our job in controlling the pathogen. We, we don't want to have it. We don't want to have any residual. And, you know, for some people, they, they get frustrated. They're like, well, you can treat my plant and then it's going to be healthy forever. And we're like, no, we'll treat your plant. And then next week or the week after, depending on what your IPM or your integrated pest management process is, you'll have to treat it again. And, uh, 
you know, that's the good news, bad news, I guess, about the technology. It's not systemic and it, it's not very uh, durable. It does its job and then it goes away. And so this is an on-site tech where you've got to have, have this equipment on site so that you can use it, as you mentioned, like uh, throughout the grow cycle repeatedly without having to store like a lot of um, liquid or, you know, whatever, like you would with pesticide. Yeah. Correct. I mean, the, the the downside is you can't do this without the right equipment. So think about like a coffee maker and coffee where you can't just make the coffee. You've got to have a special coffee maker and the special bean to make this, in this case, uh, antimicrobial. But the good news is in that process is is we can be very cost effective. We can be very, very inexpensive for people who are using this in volume, um, as little as a dollar a gallon, which can treat several plants, maybe uh, – even smaller plants, even several dozen plants. But the um, the other benefit is we've really reduced the whole no- notion of transporting and storing, you know, plastic containers or steel drums or whatever you might have of these chemistries. So there's a, a less environmental impact, if you will. You also don't have to worry about disposal of chemistry that's been sitting there or, or has to be destroyed. And a lot of the pesticides that are being used, not so much in cannabis, but maybe in other food crops, um, they have a shelf life. But even then, when they don't become inert. They just stick around. They're very, they're engineered to be durable and they, uh, they have that long-term impact impact in the environment, even if they haven't been sprayed, even if they just have to be destroyed, right? They can't just be put into normal landfill as, as an example, at least not legally. That, that reminds me of, of something, um, on your website that caught my eye. It said, uh, you users can create a safer work environment, rely less on personal protective equipment, simplify their operations, reduce waste, as you just mentioned, and also have control of those supply chains. Um, and I think that's so pivotal right now. <coughs> really globally, we're dealing with these supply chain disruptions. Um, so having something that you could on-site produce and not have to worry about those variables you mentioned, I think has a lot of value at different parts of that supply chain. So yeah, that's a powerful point. Yeah, I mean, I want to, and you didn't ask a question, but let me add two points to that, which I think are, are interesting. One is when we had the pandemic and we had just started the company, um, we ended up producing chemistry, which was not our business model in any way, um, for state police, for um, hospitals. We even uh, have an ongoing fire department that uses it to disinfect their equipment, and they love it because it doesn't have a lot of the properties that. Um, peroxide or chlorine or other disinfectants would would have. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And that whole issue was born out of the supply chain disruption. So a person mm. who uses our stuff doesn't have to really worry about the same kind of supply chain disruptions. But the single biggest thing I found has been interesting is we knew that workers would be happier and safer and they would adopt it just like the growers and the folks who are worried about the economics of the crops. But what we didn't realize is that people would end up kind of creating a culture around this. And we've had several growers who've come back and said it's become kind of a bonding component that they know their product is treated safely for not only them as growers or employees, but also for their end users. So they take a lot of pride. We actually have a uh, cultivator in Oregon now who's starting to market that their system, that their product rather is treated with Herivera. And, and we, we didn't set out for that but in a way that's really kind of the core value proposition right is we want patients and consumers to feel confident that what they're getting is going to be not only high quality but it's not going to cause them to get sick yeah absolutely and so it, it's a, it's become a source of pride for some of these growers and we love it i'm excited for there to be a time when it's easier for growers to disseminate that information how they grew the inputs they used because i think increasingly consumers are going to be paying attention to that. You know, that if I was to say one key message out of this whole discussion is um, as much as good regulations help, I think the biggest issue that can help move the industry in the right direction is transparency. And the more information customers Mm -hmm. have, they'll make smart decisions. Like when you go to Whole Foods and you go, hey, this, uh, you know, organic apple cost me 30 cents more and this one that was grown with pesticides, do I value that? And increasingly people are saying, yes, I do. I'm willing to pay that price to get a better quality product that's not going to get me sick. And I think cannabis consumers are no different. They, they want the best products. And if they know how their product is treated, um, they will reward those growers. I mean, today everybody thinks, well, I've got THC that's 25% versus 20%. And that's been the, the driving force of cannabis growers. But I think increasingly it's going to be 
you know, what's the quality of this product? How good does it smell? What are the terpenes? And how was it grown? And was it grown in a sustainable way? And was it grown with stuff that might cause me to be sick? And um, I think the good growers will be rewarded for taking those extra steps, whether they use TerraVera or some other process to make sure that their product is, is free of those pesticides. Uh, I think they'll be very happy in the long run that they, do, they take those steps. Yeah, I would agree. And I, you you launched this initially in five states, um, and mm-hmm. now you're serving the, the entire U.S. So what are you most excited about as the company continues to expand? You know, we are we're certainly looking forward to getting into crops um, in addition to cannabis. So we've had inquiries into hops, wine grapes, um, a okay. couple of other areas that we think are pretty promising. So that's further down the road. But I think the... Um, You know, getting back to what I'm looking forward to the most is probably what's happening, like I said, with this grower in Oregon, where you're seeing people not just have efficacy in the grows, but they're promoting it externally. And uh, and that's what we're excited to be part of is kind of a movement towards better quality product, uh, organic product, natural product. And uh, I think more and more states should be paying attention to you know making sure not just that they're testing for the stuff. But they're labeling it and consumers can go in and say, hey, how was my product treated? I'm excited so. for that, too. Yeah, well said. Um, where can people go to to learn more about TerraVera and the work you're doing, Carlos? Um, well, we always love people to come to our website. It's uh, www.terravera.com, T-E-R-R-A-V-E-R-A.com. Uh, we certainly are on social media and love interacting with folks uh, there. Uh, and you know, we always want to invite folks to come see our other client sites. Uh, but yeah, th- those are the primary ways and, uh, love to hear from folks. Right on. Well, I know I learned a lot. I'm very excited about this tech and I hope, um, we'll start seeing more innovative solutions like this to these problems. So I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thank you for the time. And again, I think cannabis has a, a an interesting role to play in helping agriculture, Uh, advance. So we are uh, proud to be a small part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, for those of us, uh, for those listening, I would say, please follow us on um, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, wherever you find your podcasts. Um, You can also find out more information about sustainability and emerging technologies at canatechtoday.com. Also, our summer issue is now on newsstands. So please go out and check that out. Uh, Until next time, this has been Carlos Perea and Patricia Miller signing off. Today's episode of Cannabis and Tech Talks is brought to you by Cerna. Designing a cultivation facility can be challenging and overwhelming. You have a lot of things to worry about and your cultivation climate shouldn't be one of them. Cerna's team of experienced licensed engineers provide stamped MEP designs to help achieve goals uniquely catered to your facility. Go to Cerna.com today to start planning your ideal cannabis climate. That's S-U-R-N-A dot com.